Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, Doing Business in Germany, Market and Collaborative Opportunities for British Columbian Companies. My name is Ganna Drost. I'm manager at the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch, British Columbia Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Chelsea Luciani, senior manager at the same branch. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the territories of the Likwangan speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Sandese First Nations. And I invite you to take a moment and to reflect on the territories and communities from where you're connecting today and where you live, work and play. So uh, our today's webinar will focus on opportunities for BC companies in German market. And Germany is an important destination for BC experts and is ranked number two as a destination uh, for BC experts to the European Union in 2020, and is also number 12 as a destination for BC experts worldwide. In today's webinar, we'll go into the opportunities that this largest consumer market in the European Union, as well as uh, has to offer, and uh, also into some collaborative projects that can help you grow uh, and boost your international presence. So we are very fortunate uh, to have experts from the provincial and federal government today who join us from Ottawa, Germany, London, and BC. And let me do a quick round of introductions. So we have Andreas Weihardt, Minister Councillor, Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner at the Canadian Embassy in Berlin. Rupert Potter, uh, Managing Director, Europe uh, Trade and Investment Representative Office of BC. Daniela Hallett, uh, Investment and Trade Specialist, who works with Rupert. Christopher Teparaja, uh, Senior Trade Finance Manager uh, for British Columbia, Vancouver Island region with Expert Development Canada. Uh, Andrew Bowder, uh, Industrial Technology Advisor at the National Research Council of Canada, uh, Industrial Research Assistance Program. Uh, and we have our special guest today, John Skinner, uh, owner of Painted Rock Estate Winery in BC. So, dear speakers, we are very thankful for your availability to join uh, and share your expertise with BC companies in today's webinar. So, uh, before uh, we kick off, uh, I'd like to go over uh, the agenda and a few housekeeping items. The webinar will last approximately one hour and a half today, and there will be five presentations. We will start with a short uh, introduction into the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, uh, and uh, we'll see how it works, and then we'll move to the presentation about BC Trade and Investment Representative Office in, in Europe and in Germany, before uh, going into the German market and expert opportunities overview by the uh, Trade Commissioner Service. Uh, we'll uh, then invite John Skinner to share his success story and uh, inspire you to start your expert journey in, in the German market. And uh, then we'll move to the overview of Expert Development Canada solutions that uh, can help you solidify your presence in Germany. And uh, we'll finish it off with a presentation about uh, joint uh, Canada or Germany Collaborative Industrial Research and Development Goal for Proposal by uh, National Research Council uh, Canada. We have reserved uh, approximately 10 minutes for a Q&A session at the end of the webinar and I invite you to use the Q&A uh, box that you can see at the bottom of your screen and uh, you may ask your questions during the webinar at any time but please try to be as specific as you can uh, and if possible mentioning who you direct your questions to. So our session is being recorded and uh, the presentations will be made available in a post event email with the exception of the uh, of Andrew's presentation that will not be shared publicly. Uh, if you experience any problems with audio or other technical issues, uh, please send a message using the uh, chat function either uh, to me or to Chelsea Luciani. So uh, let's uh, start with a quick introduction into the role of uh, BC uh, Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. And uh, then I'll also move to the uh, Canada's free trade agreements and show you where they are. Uh, and I'll explain uh, what the Canada European Union Comprehensive uh, Economic and Trade Agreement does and what key, key opportunities it offers for, for goods. And we'll show you some, some resources as well. 
So the BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation aims to, to make life more affordable for British Columbians by building a strong and sustainable economy uh, and uh, improve the standard of living. And increasing trade and investment for BC uh, is critical and is important part of our government's economic recovery plan. And there are many ways to, to increase trade. And one way is to encourage businesses to leverage opportunities that are offered in free trade agreements and help you to diversify your export markets. And that's what we are going to do today. Of course, governments do not trade, but businesses like you do. And uh, we focus on providing you support and having your back when you do your business outside of the province, domestically or internationally. So uh, Canada, of course, is the trading nation. And today we have 15 free trade agreements that cover 49 countries. Those agreements give you access to nearly 90% of export markets or about 1.5 billion potential consumers worldwide. So this map shows you where in the world Canada currently has those free trade agreements in place. And uh, the trade agreements uh, that are in force are marked in blue. And some of the well-known are, of course, CUSMA, uh, Canada's agreement with the US and Mexico, uh, the CPTPP-1, which is Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this agreement is currently in force between Canada, Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, and Mexico. Uh, and of course, the CETA, Canada's Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with the, with the European Union, and we are going to dive into it now. So uh, the CETA is uh, Canada's most ambitious trade agreement so far. It covers lots of sectors and aspects of trade. Uh, the European Union market is the world's largest single market and largest integrated economy. And it is market of approximately 440 uh, million consumers and accounts for over uh, $25 trillion uh, in GDP. Uh, CETA has been provisionally in force since September 2017. And what it means that it has been uh, provisionally in force, um, it means that uh, so far 15 uh, out of 27 EU member states have ratified it uh, and it will come into full force once all uh, EU member states ratify it. But so far, um, this means that 95% of the agreement is already in effect. So with the CETA, Canada is now uh, the only G7 country uh, with preferential FTA access to two largest economies, the European Union and the US. And Canadian companies also currently retain significant competitive advantage over uh, US exporters into the uh, EU market since the US does not have a trade agreement uh, with the European Union. Uh, so now let's see what uh, CETA offers in terms of, uh, of benefits. So one uh, of the key and more tangible benefit uh, of free trade agreements is tariff reduction and uh, tariff elimination. And on day one uh, of CETA preliminary entry into force, 98% uh, of the EU tariff line on Canadian goods were eliminated, uh, including those on key BC exports, uh, such as forest products, metals and minerals, uh, some manufactured goods and also uh, most of the agricultural food. So another 1% uh, will be phased out by 2023. And on this slide, you can see um, some of the tariff uh, eliminations and reductions that are already in effect. Um, so you can see that 96% of fish and seafood tariffs were eliminated and 94% of agriculture and agri-food tariffs were eliminated as well. Uh, the important thing is that uh, the preferential treatment and the preferential tariff is not automatic and you have to claim it. You have to claim it either on your invoice, uh, proving that uh, your uh, product originates in Canada, uh, or you can also fill it uh, a separate origin declaration um, that uh, proves that your, where your product comes from and uh, uh, that it complies with the rules of origin. So let's 
see what other um, opportunities CETA offers for goods. And uh, as for, um, except for tariffs, there are also non-tariff barriers and uh, they are often technical requirements, of course, and uh, some different standards that exist uh, between countries, such as certification procedures, labeling requirements, and some other regulations related to human, animal, or plant health. And fortunately, CETA contains a protocol on the mutual acceptance of the results of conformity assessment. Uh, and this protocol was designed uh, to allow uh, Canadian products in certain categories to be tested and certified uh, to the EU standards in Canada and vice versa. Uh, so covered by this protocol uh, are some uh, of areas, for example, electrical and electronic equipment, um, electrical installations and appliances and some related components, uh, radio and uh, telecom telecommunication equipment, uh, hot water boilers, machinery, toys, um, of course, this is the protocol and there is some work behind that needs to be done by both parties, by Canada and the European Union. And as of April this year, there are already four Canadian certification bodies that can certify equipment for use in potentially explosive uh, atmospheres, such as mines. And those bodies are recognized in the EU and can officially now certify the Canadian products to be shipped there. Um, and some more uh, Canadian bodies are to be certified and this is a work in, in progress. So most importantly, uh, free trade agreements like the CETA, uh, they create transparency and predictability in doing business in foreign markets for suppliers of goods, services and for those seeking to attract investment or to, to invest. So now I just wanted to quickly uh, show you some uh, resources that might, you might find useful uh, for determining your preferential tariff treatment or uh, when submitting your claim about uh, tariff barrier. So I'll start with the uh, Canada Tariff Finder. Uh, this tool helps you to, to determine your tariff preference in a select Canada FTA market. It's a handy and fairly user-friendly tool for figuring out your um, tariff, uh, the, the tariff that your product will face in a market uh, with, with which Canada has an FTA. So it includes uh, detailed information uh, on uh, tariff phase-outs for CETA, for example, for um, up to seven, seven years until 2023. Uh, and uh, it can also uh, serve you as a comparison. Uh, you can compare the duties applicable to your product uh, in, in other markets as well. So all you need to begin uh, in is the FTA market, choose the FTA market you're interested in and the product that you want uh, to export or to import. And you can find product by using uh, HS code uh, if you know it or just a keyword. So next I wanted to share with you um, the uh, similar resource that the European Union has developed. And this tool is called the Access uh, to Markets. And this is a new portal uh, that uh, you exporters and importers uh, can use to find the detailed information on tariffs, rules of origin, product requirements, some customs procedures and formalities, uh, VAT, excise duties, and uh, some trade statistics as well. So I encourage you to visit this site and you have the link here uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and it will give you a, a sense of what exporting your product to the European Union market will look like, as well as provide you some further links for, for your reference. So another resource, a uh, very handy one, um, will be the, uh, one of the, my last slides, uh, is the uh, website where you can report a trade barrier to the uh, Trade Commissioner service. So trade barriers, they come in two forms, tariff and non-tariff barriers. And trade barriers, they also include some administrative procedures or quantitative restrictions like quotas, some licensing requirements or uh, price controls and uh, labeling sometimes as well. So it is important to remember that some regulations and procedures will be uh, considered a trade barrier and some regulations uh, might be there in place to protect public health or, or the environment. But when you are facing a legitimate trade barrier, uh, 
it is useful to get the information there and to let the federal government know about it. And you may think that uh, uh, someone has already reported this, prob this uh, problem or barrier, but uh, it's not necessarily true. And uh, the more uh, the federal government hears about this barrier, um, the uh, quicker it uh, might be uh, resolved. Uh, so it is helpful to to let uh, the federal government know about anything that uh, that you face that might be a barrier. Um, and finally, I just wanted to uh, show you a quick um, slide with the, uh, our contact details and some uh, of the uh, social media resources that uh, that have. Uh, so if if you have questions about Canada's free trade agreements uh, or how to use them, just get in touch with us and uh, uh, also try and check our um, social media links to stay up to date with the current developments and uh, uh, latest trade uh, related events. So now I'll, uh, I want to pass it over to Daniela Hallett from uh, BC uh, Trade and Investment Office in, in Germany for her presentation uh, of, uh, of the office and some key sectors of interest. Daniela, over to you. Thank you, Ghana. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is Daniela Hallett, and I am part of a team of seven that represent PC in Europe. Our managing director, as Ghana already mentioned, is Rupert Potter, who is with us on the call today. Um, during today's webinar, I would like to provide a brief overview of our services and what we're seeing in the German market in the sectors we cover. Um, just to remember or to remind you all, we work to uh, BC's Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Um, our main office for Europe is based in London, but we also have a colleague in the Netherlands and me in Germany. Um, our mandate is to support BC businesses accessing the European market, as well as to work uh, with international businesses in discovering the benefits of BC as a destination for investment, a partner for innovation or a source of quality goods, services and resources. To do this, we provide market intelligence and advice and we help BC businesses meet potential buyers, investors and other partners in Europe. Additionally, we also partner or work closely uh, with the trade commissioners in each European country and also industry bodies and associations. We help organize trade missions, events, seminars, we attend some of the main industry events with a booth or as a Canadian, as part of a Canadian pavilion. Um, next slide, Ghana, please. Thank you. Um, as you can see in this organigram, uh, we cover a range of sectors based on their relevance and importance for BC, combined with where we see opportunities for trade and investment in the European market. Next slide, please. Thank you. The next few slides provide an overview of the sectors we focus on uh, proactively and some of the dynamics we are seeing in Germany within those sectors. Starting with agri-food, um, in agri-food our focus is mainly on helping BC food processors get in front of European buyers, including online sales and virtual showcases and B2B matchmaking programs. As you might know, and Ghana has mentioned already as well, Germany is the strongest economy and the most populous member state of the European Union and one of the world's largest or leading agri-food importers. Um, despite the ongoing COVID crisis, German consumers remained optimistic um, about the financial future and their overall expenditure has stayed relatively constant, which is also due to the fact that the government has introduced some extensive economic relief programs uh, to help mitigate the effects of the crisis. Um, generally speaking, the German food and beverage market is receptive uh, to new cultural influences and culinary trends, and both national and international companies operate in almost every sub-segment of the market. The food and the beverage industry is the fourth largest in Germany, and the largest sector segment by production value are meat and sausage products, dairy products, baked goods, and confectionery. Um, health and environment awareness are also playing an increasingly significant role. Fair trade and organic products have become even ever more important and consumers are increasingly demanding traceability and information about production methods. Um, ethnic foods, beauty foods, superfoods, clean label foods, free from products, vegetarian, vegan products, you name them, um, are gaining also more and more in popularity among German consumers. And this corresponds with an expanding consumer base that sees its choice of products 
or eating habits as either a lifestyle statement or even a political statement. Um, it's also interesting to mention that German consumers, industry and retail markets also have a strong aversion to products containing GMOs um, due to their potential risk to health and the environment. And um, since the German government has banned uh, GMO cultivation and introduced the non-GMO certification, which is called ohne Gentechnik, um, the issue of GMOs continues to affect people's acceptance of CETAT, has to be said. Um, so incorporating certified organic, non-GMO, vegetarian, vegan, free from items in product lines can be highly beneficial when, want, when you want to enter the German market. As some of you have also might already experienced, Germany is a very price sensitive market, but consumers on the other hand are also increasingly willing to spend more on quality products. Additionally, the aging population and health conscious consumers are fueling demand for functional food products. So in addition, um, a rising number of single households combined with fast paced living are also driving demand for ready to eat meals, ready to eat desserts, snacks, baking mix, anything that yeah, uses less time to prepare. In retail, the trend of e-commerce has been accelerated since the pandemic. And I think this is globally. Um, the overall market and digitalization are still growing from a low base, however. In 2019, online food sales accounted for less than 1% um, of total German food sales, meaning this is a route uh, BC firms might want to consider barriers to entry for cooperating with um, national fulfillment and logistics providers are relatively moderate. However, there are real challenges to consider before deciding if Germany is the right market to try. Imports from Canada um, yeah, face competition from products from neighboring EU member states and it is a mature market with a high domestic ability to meet most of local demand. Strict national and EU regulation for imports mean Canadian exporters need to offer products that meet all levels of packaging, labeling, safety, distribution requirements. And given that food importers, imports from other member states within the EU fall under the free movement of goods principle, third country manufacturers may be required to uh, register e on EU approved, approved lists. And the German market can be daunting for Canadian exporters, given the dominance of domestic giants like, such as Badeberger, Gerold Steiner, Brunnen, Dr. Edgar, just to name um, a few. When talking about Acritech, although we support BC Acritech firms looking to access the German market, the, the German and wider European market, we work more on supporting expertise to invest in BC and partner with BC stakeholders. Um, Germany has always been a strong agricultural, has always had a strong agricultural sector. Despite um, a high population density, um, half the territory is put to agricultural use. The COVID crisis um, has further enhanced trends uh, such as the use of agricultural technologies, given its ability to help the farming sector enhance its sustainability and recover from the outbreak's impact. Digital agricultural solutions such as drones and other tools can help achieve efficiency savings. Other digital solutions uh, can link farmers to buyers and logistics services. Remote sensing tools combined with machine learning offers a promising approach to mapping disruptions um, in crop production. The digitalization of the agri-food sector is also a leading theme in the EU's farm to fork strategy, which underlines that all actors in the food chain should utilize technology and digital solutions to deliver on sustainability goals. Such methods can be applied from beekeeping to animal husbandry, aquaculture and aquaponics. Another long-term effect from the COVID crisis might be increased attention for local for local farming, which in urban environments may drive new farming technologies such as vertical farming and urban farming uh, methods. BC has a strong and growing agri-tech sector with companies potentially able to benefit from um, these developments, in our opinion. Um, within life science and health, we encourage European partnerships and investments into BC as well as supporting BC firms exporting into Europe. Germany offers the largest market, market for products within Europe. Both market demand and location factors make it a preferred choice for many international companies. The country is home to several large medtech companies, but the sector, as in many other sectors, is dominated by uh, the German Mittelstand, which, is, um, which are SMEs. 
many of whom also export abroad. Overall, there's a stable demand for high quality advanced diagnostics and therapeutic equipment, innovative technologies and minimal invasive equipment in vascular surgery, urology, gastrology, gastroenterology, dermatology, and neurosurgery, for example. Um, trends in the market include the move to wearable and wireless medical technologies, more personalized medicine based on each individual patient requirements, computer assisted surgery, um, the shrinking of electromedical equipment and nanotechnology products, and new technologies emerging and first responder care. Germany is also proactive in solutions to address the aging population. Um, it is expected that by 20 20, uh, 2035, there will be around 24 million people over 65, and the over 50s will account for approximately half of Germany's population. So there will be an uptake in demand for diagnostic equipment to detect chronic disease in the early stages to prevent higher costs later on, as well as demand for specialized wound care and easy to use home care products. Big data technology is in high demand in all segments as well. However, Canadian capabilities in digital healthcare, unfortunately, are not so well known in Germany. Primary competitors are local systems developers, but these also represent potential partners for cooperation, including technology transfer, joint ventures, joint research, and mutual market access. Um, AI is already widely employed across the German life science sector too. Wearables and robots, uh, robots that perform repetitive laboratory tasks or complex surgeries are common. Um, the German government invested around 500 million uh, euros in AI in 2019 with a special focus on uh, care and biotechnology. Germany is also home to several well-known AI clusters, which are among Europe's largest, like the Cyber Valley in Tübingen and this south of Germany. However, there are still opportunities for BC companies in the sectors though. Experts expect healthcare growth of 3.4% by 2030 and Germany's Federal Ministry of Education and Research has therefore implemented an initiative to merge data from clinical settings and research institutions, make it, making it um, usable for different types of application to promote AI projects. But once again, a word of caution, the German life science market also presents a challenge as industry giants like Siemens, Bayer, Träger, B. Braun, Bayersdorf and Fresenius are well entrenched. So to enter this market, new exporters must be really cutting edge and have high quality, competitively priced products. And a successful entry to the German market first requires the establishment of a strong scientific or technical reputation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, which leads me on to ICT and the digital interactive media sector. Key, sub no, sorry. Key subsectors of interest here include cybersecurity, Internet of Things, big data, cloud computing, business IT, data centers, small, smart business, uh, social platforms, integrated systems, VR, AR, and digital factory. Um, Germany has one of the largest ICT markets in the world and is the largest software market in Europe. There's a strong demand for products and services across all segments with key firms such as Microsoft, Apple, Dell, Adobe, IBM, Oracle, and SAP, all having large market shares already. There are also many highly specialized SMEs again in this market. ICT overall is a priority sector for the German government. Uh, Germany's economic and innovation policy is outlined in the digital agenda of the Federal Ministry of Economics and Energy. It focuses on digital infrastructure, economy, workplaces, public administration, education, research, science, culture, and security. Policy objectives include cybersecurity, the digitization of the German economy, and the expansion of the German broadband network. network. But challenges include ensuring compliance with EU digital single market, the general data protection regulation, GDPR, and the e privacy regulation on ICT companies. Um, in advanced manufacturing, we support trade and investment and help foster tech partnerships with major European firms to support ITB offsets. Our focus here is on aerospace, marine, and infrastructure. Um, to carry on with aerospace, the German aerospace sector is an important driver of the German economy and one of the leading high tech industries, including in robotics, measuring, control and materials technology, 
But as across as the rest of the world, uh, the market has experienced big challenges from the pandemic. According to the German Aerospace Industries Association, a number of small and medium-sized companies are even struggling to survive. There may be some opportunities in process digitization and smart manufacturing, smart propulsion systems, and um, enhanced product lifecycle management. But for BC companies, opportunities in the traditional supply chain business remains limited at best. To add to this, um, the German Aerospace Industries Association aims to preserve the technical and economic capabilities of the German aviation industry with procurement program decisions giving preference for European and national solutions. I thought um, that might be worth mentioning as well. In marine, uh, German shipyards are said to be a world leader in building vessels for the cruise industry, luxury yachts, harbor, research and cargo vessels, to name a few. Smaller shipyards also produce a variety of vessels for military and security purpose. German shipyards usually have an integrated supply network and present opportunities to Canadian producers to engage, um, including green technologies such as dual fuel and LNG propulsions, uh, scrubber and exhaust treatment, solar technology and fuel cells, engine optimization, energy saving devices and mobile LNG power plants. Um, Germany has also several seaports and inland ports that could be relevant customers for BC marine tech solutions. The ocean tech sector is very dynamic with potential for BC in different areas like offshore oil and gas, wind and marine, renewables, energy, um, ocean mining, maritime security, Arctic, polar and marine research, marine monitoring and environmental protection technology, um, to name a few again there are more. The market includes different system integrators and small companies that develop solutions for all fields of applications. Um, within clean growth, I think it's worth mentioning that Germany is also home to one of the most advanced environmental technology markets. Environmentally friendly products are a key success factor for the country's economy. In 2016, environmentally friendly energy generation, energy efficiency, resource efficiency and sustainable Mobility, sustainable water management, waste management, and recycling amount to around 15% of uh, GDP. This is expected to increase to around 20% by 2025, and we believe it offers promising opportunities for foreign companies wishing to expand their green business um, in Germany. For BC, we are working particularly in subsectors such as hydrogen, the circular economy, water, wastewater management, carbon management building and marine technology. The combination of clean BC and Germany's drive to clean tech make the sector at large a strong base for further development. Next slide, please. Thank you. I'm not going into much detail on this, on this slide because I think there aren't any companies from these sectors joining us today. By way of quick summary, though, we are proactive in forestry, although not specifically for Germany, more in other parts of Europe, for example, the Nordics and the UK. Um, energy is the most relevant for the German market, particularly with the emphasis in both Germany and BC on developing the hydrogen economy, renewables, energy management and infrastructure around natural gas and LNG. For mining, we are more reactive and happy to help where we can. But we have not dealt with this specifically um, in Germany, with our focus here being more in London as a key market for mining capital. One of my colleagues, uh, Graham Hilton, uh, is based in UK and he leads on all of these sectors on the slide. So if anyone is interested, uh, I'll be more than happy to make connections and we are, would like to work with you. Just um, to come to a conclusion, so it's probably a little bit difficult, but um, I think it's it's fair to say that the German market overall provides great opportunities for BC in trade and investment. Um, in large part, this is due to its large scale, how advanced it is, um, some of the major trends we see around consumer behavior, health, energy, and the environment, and the benefits of CETA, of course. But there are also challenges, particularly in areas where German or other European companies uh, dominate the market or where there's an increasing trend towards localization. So with this in mind, the best way then to determine if this market is right for your specific product 
would be to find the right partner and um, of course to do as much research as possible and to speak um, to us in Europe but also to Andreas uh, Weichert, um, uh, the trade commissioner, who is also happy to help. Um, the next slide please, Gana, or the next two slides. Um, here we just see some BC companies that are active in Europe already, just to provide a brief overview. I'm sure there are a few more we just haven't fit on there. And on the next slide, it's the other way around, where BC company, uh, yeah, where European companies are already active in BC. So um, thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, um, please let us know. We're happy to help. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela, for this comprehensive uh, presentation on uh, BC Trade and Investment Office in Europe and the services that you provide uh, to, to BC companies in, in Germany and the highlights of uh, some of the areas. So I'm now pleased to uh, hand it over to Andreas Weihart uh, from Canadian Embassy in Berlin for his presentation on Trade Commissioner Service, overview of uh, German economy and market opportunities, as well as some handful tips. Andreas, over to you. Thanks, Kana. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining the uh, this webinar to, uh, this afternoon, this morning, your time. Uh, as Kana said, my name is Andreas Weikert. I'm a trade commissioner. I've been a trade commissioner for over 25 years, uh, serving Canada at a number of different posts. I am the senior trade commissioner here in Germany, covering uh, the government of Canada's uh, commercial programs here. Uh, been here since 2018, based in the Canadian Embassy in Berlin, and I head up our three offices in Germany, which cover trade, investment, science and technology, and innovation programs. Um, next slide. So I will touch on many of the same things that Daniela has covered, and, and thank you for the plug, Daniela, at the end. Absolutely talk to us. And so I'll focus, I guess, a little bit more on the... Uh, elements that, uh, that uh, haven't been covered yet. Um, a little bit on CETA, a little bit on the economy, uh, some key sectors, a little bit on business etiquette, and then uh, what's going on with COVID here. Next slide, please. So the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service, I, I hope many of you are familiar with us. Um, we are celebrating, we did celebrate our 125th anniversary uh, last year, helping Canadian businesses to succeed in global markets. Our first trade commissioner arrived in Australia in 1895, and our first trade office in Germany was opened in 1910. Uh, and uh, pleased that we have the three offices. Uh, we're on the ground in over 160 cities worldwide. Uh, we are across Canada. Your local office is in Vancouver. Uh, we look for market intelligence. We help to uncover opportunities for Canadian companies. Uh, it's free. Free is good. I like free. Um, we help you uh, through our core services uh, of preparing for international markets. We assess your market potential. We give you some tips on how you can do business in your chosen markets. And then we find you qualified contacts to do business with. And if you do happen to get into trouble, we can try and help you out with that too. Uh, depending what the problem is. Um, next slide, please. A little bit about uh, free trade agreements uh, that, that has not already been covered. Um, Canada is the only G7 country that has trade agreements with all the other G7 countries, um, which makes us somewhat unique. Uh, not surprising, we are a trading nation. Uh, we always have been. Uh, FTAs help companies to do more trade, providing competitive advantages by lowering tariffs, protection for investors in both directions, increase your transparency uh, of what problems you can face and how to overcome them. Uh, you, have, you have rules in place. Uh, we have, uh, it, it helps create better standards in both trading partners. It improves cooperation between trading partners. Um, as uh, Daniela had said, it's not automatic. You do have to register for uh, taking advantage of these uh, benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So we've talked a little bit about CETA already. Um, this is a big one. Uh, and, and in fact, CETA, we 
we talk about it as the gold uh, gold star trade agreement. It's it's the most comprehensive that Canada or the EU have ever negotiated. Uh, both sides want to use it as the model for future trade agreements with other partners. Um, it includes protections for uh, governments to take action on certain areas of competence, such as the environment. Um, but it but it really does open up the markets for the benefits of uh, all players. Since CETA came into effect provisionally in September of 2017, uh, the growth in trade has continued even through the COVID time. Uh, we've increased annually by over 21% in merchandise trade between Canada and the European Union. EU is now Canada's second largest trading partner with over $165 billion worth of goods and services in bilateral trade in 2019. Next slide, please. So what does CETA offer to Canadian firms? We covered a little bit of that earlier on. CETA covers virtually all the sectors and aspects of Canada-EU trade and seeks to eliminate or reduce barriers in all of these areas. Trade in goods, CETA eliminates tariffs and reduces barriers for virtually all sectors and aspects of trade. Prior to the agreement, only 25% of EU tariff lines on Canadian goods were duty-free. With CETA, 98% of EU tariff lines are now duty-free for Canadian goods. We frequently meet Canadian companies who are in the market for the first time, and they tell us they would not be here trying to sell if it were not for CETA having eliminated those tariffs. Um, rules of origin, we talked about uh, clear and favorable rules that consider Canada's supply chains, determining which products are considered originating and therefore eligible for preferential tariff treatment. Customs and trade facilitation, Canada and EU are working to keep customs procedures simple, clear and effective and predictable. This reduces your processing times at the border and makes it easier to move goods. Uh, regulatory cooperation and conformity assessment, uh, that's been, I kind of talked about that at the beginning. Um, I did want to stress that there are working groups that meet regularly to discuss these areas. Um, so the, the website on reporting uh, trade barriers that you have encountered is very important in informing the Canadian government as to what to bring to these working groups. What do we need to talk to the Europeans about? Uh, relies on, on uh, exporters like yourselves telling us where you're having problems. Um, government procurement is another area I wanted to mention. Canadian companies can now bid on opportunities at all levels of government in the EU, which opens up potential business estimated at something like $3.3 trillion annually. Um, this is a remarkable achievement in a free trade agreement. Trade and services and labor mobility, CETA provides Canadian service providers with more business opportunities in the EU and makes it easier for certain skilled professionals to work temporarily in the EU. Investment is covered under the, uh, the provisions in CETA that are designed to give investors greater certainty, stability and protection for their investments and to provide access to an independent dispute resolution mechanism. And finally, sustainable development, labor and the environment. I mentioned that at the beginning. CETA does make clear commitments to uphold Canada's high standards and not to undermine them for commercial gain. Clear language confirms the right to regulate for all levels of government. Next slide, please. So a few key market facts uh, for Germany. Um, largest European market, 83 million inhabitants. Actually, I heard 85 million uh, the other day from a local source. 16% of the total European population. Largest economy in Europe, uh, fourth largest in the world, GDP of $5 trillion. It's about 21% of total European GDP. If you're coming to the EU, it's not really a country you can afford to ignore. It's a fifth of the total. The German economy is very open to imports and exports, uh, totaling 88% of their GDP. It's our first trading partner. Uh, sorry, it's for most European countries, it is their first trading partner within the EU, and it's the sixth largest trading partner for Canada. Germany imported $7 billion worth of goods from Canada in 2019, which is the last year I've got figures for in front of me. Uh, with the implementation of CETA, I think it's worth noting that uh, the areas 
where the largest reduction in tariffs took place has seen some, some pretty explosive growth and, and some of it's on the slides there, chemical products, 132,000% growth. And that's uh, massive numbers. Uh, they are some small areas of export, but nonetheless, it does show that removing the tariffs can make a real difference. Next slide, please. So Germany exports, uh, sorry, Canadian exports to Germany. Uh, it's uh, Canada's largest destination for exports to the EU. Um, and for Canada, it's the fourth largest source of imports after the US, China, and Mexico. Um, Germany is a manufacturing uh, country with leading exports, uh, which include vehicles, vehicle parts, machinery, chemical, pharmaceutical products, computer, electrical equipment. And these are all among the top items that Canada imports from Germany. In terms of opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises and larger companies, getting into these value chains to help to produce some of these, uh, these products that are coming back to Canada anyway, uh, is a good market strategy. Next slide, please. So specific sectors, um, again, I, I, I actually don't disagree with any of the ones that Daniela put up and, and some of them are here. Um, the top three sectors, automotive, uh, which will go into manufacturing, uh, a lot of good uh, Canadian companies having success in the automotive uh, value chains here. Uh, clean tech is, uh, is very big. I, I have the regional clean tech trade commissioner based here in Berlin uh, for Europe. And we do, uh, we, we do all sorts of work, including with a number of BC companies. Life sciences has been mentioned again, a strong sector for BC, seeing a lot of activity from BC companies there. Um, in the other opportunities also, all three of those, I think, uh, are areas where, uh, there are, uh, BC companies active here in Germany um, that, uh, that are having some very good success. I won't go through the numbers on the relative sizes. I think Daniela has covered it, and if not, we can certainly send you uh, the full numbers later. We'll go to the next slide, please. So doing business in Germany, why would you choose Germany to do business? Well, as I've said, it's a major market for many industries, and it's a huge consumer market in, in the EU which provides opportunity for many niche products. Germany combines high capacity innovation, an excellent workforce and good infrastructure with moderate wage cost, competitive tax system, and one of the highest productivity rates in Europe. There's a history of good scientific collaboration between Canada and Germany. This year, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Bilateral Science and Technology Agreement, which has supported more than a thousand joint research projects. Germany is also highly interested in Canadian expertise in artificial intelligence and its multiple possibilities in many sectors. Um, Hydrogen has been mentioned, and this is an area where we can only guess how big it's going to be. Uh, but uh, with the climate goals that both Canada and Germany have committed themselves to, it's, uh, they cannot be achieved unless we can make great strides in the hydrogen uh, uh, research. Challenges, um, I've noticed, very competitive market, uh, and there are countries nearby that are doing similar things that we are competing with. Um, so your product really needs to be either very high quality, good quality, uh, or at a significantly better price. Germans are willing to pay for the higher quality um, if it's good, and if, it's, if, it, if they see it as something better, they will pay for it. Um, German itself, uh, sort of going on with challenges, Germany itself and, and as part of the EU has a regulatory framework that can be quite complex. Uh, so getting, getting advice on how to uh, navigate it is, is vital. Having a German partner or being well advised, including by the Trade Commissioner Service here uh, and by uh, BC Trade and Export uh, can certainly help in navigating the system. And finally, we talked about family enterprises constituting the majority of the business environment in Germany. And it's preferable to have a long-term strategy. Short-term buying and selling is often viewed unfavorably. So be patient, have, have a plan, do your follow-up, and give your partner time to think about uh, what, your, uh, what your plan is. Next slide, please. Etiquette, um, some of these will, will seem almost, uh, uh, well, 
no surprise, I think. Be on time. Shaking hands is a good one. This is an older slide and I didn't, uh, didn't see to take that out. It's interesting to watch the COVID effect because even in Germany, the, the hands, certainly for the, almost the first year, the hand would still sh shoot out to shake and then suddenly they'd realize what they were doing and they'd, they'd turn and get your elbow in instead. Um, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't mean don't have eye contact uh, uh, while you're uh, elbow to elbow. Um, communicating, be direct, be open. Uh, they appreciate it if you express yourself clearly. Um, values, uh, value of structures and rules. Germany, uh, there's many rules and regulations and procedures and processes. Uh, many German business people prefer contracts and written agreements over verbal agreements. Um, dressing appropriately, although I, I know I haven't used very many ties, uh, not just because of COVID, but in general. Um, Still dress smartly, that, that's important. Showing up in, uh, in jeans may not get you what you're looking for. Um, it is a male dominated business environment here still, but we are seeing some changes and uh, notably we ran uh, a female business mission uh, into Germany back in 2018. And it was so well received uh, by, by the community here that in fact they ran a, a female mission back to Canada. Um, still, the number of female managers is still tiny, about 15% in uh, SMEs. Um, and self-employment is pretty small too, uh, about 7%, uh, about half the figure for men. So uh, female entrepreneur is an exception, but it's growing, it's changing. Uh, next slide, please. And just very briefly on COVID-19, um, Germany's weathered this reasonably well. Um, there were good supports to, uh, to the public, uh, people who went on to short-term work. There were good supports to, uh, to businesses that had to close. So um, the pent-up demand is, is uh, similar to other countries, but perhaps more so because it, it was a pretty rich uh, support program here. Um, and uh, the likelihood of, uh, of the boom coming when, when things do finally open up uh, is a good sign for our higher quality products. And I'll leave the rest of those bullets. Next slide, please. Um, well, it brings me to the thank you, and I think I've hit my time about right, so I will leave it there. Thank you for listening. I hope this has given you some ideas uh, to consider the German market. And I look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Andres, for this great overview. I'm sure that uh, we'll be getting lots of questions regarding the, the market opportunities and services that your team can provide in the German market and about the Germany uh, as a whole. So without further ado, uh, I'm excited to invite John Skinner uh, to share his experience of getting into the German market. And John started in the German market a decade ago or so, and uh, now he can boast a network of at least six distributors selling his wine to, to Michelin stars, uh, to Michelin uh, star restaurants in Europe. And uh, John, over to you. Well, thank you, Ghana. Um, sorry, I've, I've got my video on here. Can you see? Ghana, can you? Um, I'm not sure if the video is working. Yeah, we can see a video. Oh, you can. Oh, okay, good. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share. Uh, my experience with our industry, the, the Canadian wine industry uh, and the British Columbia wine industry for the simple reason that about a decade ago, maybe a little less, um, I participated in an event in Germany called Provine. It's, in, it's an annual event in Dusseldorf. And, um, you know, I was skeptical. I was going to London, I was going to China, I was going to Japan, and I wasn't really sure the reception, um, the first event that I went to, the Canada Pavilion, it's always been very, very well organized and it's in March every year. Uh, it's an enormous event. And when, when we went into the larger pavilion, there, there are about 10 of these that are for the overall event. It's three days. Um, the Canada Pavilion was, was pretty, pretty tiny and not very well attended. There's probably a person an hour coming up to me in, in our, thing and it was a little discouraging i went in year two and there for the three days there were about 10 people an hour and they'd all been referred well in the last year pre-covid that i was there there were constantly 50 people in front of us um, i've got distributors all over the place it isn't about 
Um, right now, it's not like I'm, I'm exporting a lot of wine, but we are getting on to the, in, onto the, in front of the right people. And really, it is, it's, it's a journey. So Canadian wine, uh, the first questions of the consumers or, or the purchasers or the, the attendees with me at the very beginning was, uh, do you make ice wine? <laughs> and no, we don't. We produce uh, bigger red wines primarily. And the community of, there's a British Columbia part, there's an Ontario part, there's a Nova Scotia part. Um, they're starting to figure out who and what we are. And what I would encourage my industry partners to do is go and be part of this. Because now I was, I mentioned again that I just did a Zoom call with seven Michelin star restaurants in, in Germany and they know who we are and they want a broader portfolio of our product. And, and it's enormously efficient doing business there. Uh, there there's, it's easier to sell wine into Germany than it is in Ontario. <laughs> like it's just, it's just so, my team have these processes down pat. Um, if any of our industry have any questions, I'm John Skinner at PaintedRock.ca and I'm happy to, to connect. But in order to participate in Provine, I would encourage you to get in touch with wine growers of BC or your provincial uh, wine re agency. Um, it is, it's, it's a huge win and, and for, for uh, you know, in our context, I didn't export any in my first year, but now we do, I probably export 15% of our 8,000 cases worldwide, but the influencers and the impact on our personal brand, our, our familial brand, our regional brand is really growing. Last year, just before COVID, I had two of my European distributors, well, two German distributors, uh, came to Painted Rock in, in Penticton. And they know who we are. They brought their families. It's, it rubber's hitting the road. And I just wanted to, to give a, a big um, voice of encouragement for participants to, to uh, um, participate or, you know, to, to, to go um, and be, be a little patient with it. But all of a sudden, you know, if you, if you wait for the business, my philosophy has always been, don't wait for the business to come to you, go and find it. Um, that's been a very, of anywhere I've gone, that's probably been the most rewarding experience is the Dusseldorf Proline experience. Um, London is really good. We do an event there at Candle House every year in May. It's a really good one to go to as well. Um, but, but, but the Provine is access to all the other countries. Like we're now in Norway, we're in uh, Denmark, we're in Belgium, we're in France. These are all different distributors. So the place you find it, go to Provine and Dusseldorf in March. And uh, um, that's just my two cents worth. And I'm always available to our industry. Um, you know, we do better as a team. And, and Canada is a very easy sell right now. Our currency is, is really competitive. Um, the German market, at my experience tells me, is, is probably of any market in, in Europe, it's most prepared to pay a fair price. And certain of the Nordic countries, they, they want to see really inexpensive prices. And that's not the model that Painted Rock produce. We, we, we just want to decanter wine of the year. Our wines are expensive to produce, so they're not, I don't sell them cheaply. On an international, as you compare it to international leaders, they're perceived to be inexpensive. And, and in Germany, one of the biggest buyers came up to me and he was really excited about buying our Syrah at $55 and he assumed it was 55 US. <laughs> I sold it to him 55 Canadian. He was thrilled. So that's just uh, my two cents worth. And I'll put it back to you now. I, I, I'm just open to participate or communicate with our industry as, as needed because I'm a cheerleader for it and it's, and it's starting to work. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot, John. And I'm sure that uh, we'll have companies, especially from wine and alcoholic beverages industry, um, who appreciated your, your insight and will be happy to, to connect those who are interested in and help them you, get in touch with yeah. you. Thanks appreciate a lot and, and talk to you shortly. Uh, so we'll, uh, we are now moving uh, on to our next presentation by uh, Chris Thiparaja uh, from Expert uh, Development Canada. And uh, Chris uh, will walk us through what uh, Canada's Expert Credit Agency is and what 
what support it offers to companies like you and uh, through some success stories of Canadian companies in the German market that use uh, the EDC product. So Chris, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Ghana, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I guess we can go to the, the next slide, uh, just keeping uh, time in, in top of my mind here. Um, a little bit of who EDC is. So we are Canada's export credit agency. We, we, we report through the Ministry of International Trade, and we are here to support Canadian companies who are growing their brands outside of Canada. Uh, we are owned by the federal government, as mentioned. However, we do uh, operate at arm's length. Uh, we are self-sustaining or self uh, we generate our own revenue, so we are self-sustaining. Uh, so a little bit different than uh, a typical government agency or department. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, globally, we do have offices around the world. We are headquartered in Ottawa with regional offices across Canada, but here you see a, a snapshot of where our offices across the world are. Uh, and these typically are housed in, in the embassy or, or somewhere uh, similar to, to the embassy where we have boots on the ground. So people in market, uh, or colleagues in market providing uh, information and, and intelligence that are fed back to, fed back to Ottawa and allowing us to uh, uh, benefit the end user, which is the Canadian exporter. Next slide, please. So our, our mission is really quite simple. At the end of the day, we're here to help companies grow globally and succeed in markets across the world, regardless of what markets those look like. Next slide. So the misconception is that um, EDC only helps companies of certain sizes. And our help is mainly focused on financial tools that will help you grow and, and continue to grow in all markets. Um, but there is no company that's too small nor too big for us to, to provide value to. Um, we report, we help companies that are exporting, whether they be a service such as, you know, software companies or engineering firms that are, are providing their, their knowledge or people to companies that are traditionally manufacturing a widget that needs to, to leave the country. Uh, regardless of the knowledge and experience that company has in international markets, we're able to provide value. And we just really need to know that you want to grow your brand in, in other markets outside of Canada. That really is the only prerequisite for us to be uh, a valuable partner in your journey. Next slide, please. So this slide is, is super busy um, and just really spits out a lot of stats, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, the numbers at a glance and how EDC uh, provided value to, to the Canadian economy and Canadian exporters in 2019. Um, we supported companies going into over 200 markets uh, globally. So, you know, traditionally it's, you know, the US or Mexico or, or the Europe, European Union, um, but there are a bunch of other markets that we have provided support on, uh, anywhere from um, Botswana to Burkina Faso and everywhere in between. What that support looks like varies from market to market, but uh, just a, an example of uh, the diversity that we see from Canadian companies. Uh, a large portion of the companies we, fo are, are we provide value to are SMEs or, or the small medium enterprises and we do have uh, initiatives for women owned and led entrepreneurs as well as uh, First Nations and uh, min uh, companies owned by minorities. Uh, next slide please. So just a couple of quick facts about uh, why exporters do better or how uh, they typically generate 121 percent more revenue than a company that isn't exporting uh, they're going to be more innovative they're going to be exposed to other ways of doing things uh, they're going to be forced to maybe regroup and reassess how they're how they're conducting business um, and therefore being uh, thrown into the the, the uh, pit of being innovative uh, and they're going to experience 20% 20, 20 less risk so um, seems counterintuitive why would I experience less risk going outside of Canada as opposed to servicing my own neighborhood but it really just goes to market saturation in the event that if all your clients and all your business is within one market and if something uh, happens within that market to disrupt you know the economy or whatever it may be um, you know that you're being diversified and have not putting all your eggs in one basket. Next slide, please. So how can EDC specifically help? Well, let's go to the next slide. 
our core offerings fall into three main buckets. I mean, you may go to our website uh, to look for assistance and it's gonna be pretty busy. Um, what I suggest is keeping in mind that there's three main, three main buckets, insurance or risk mitigation, working capital solutions or financing, and knowledge. From a financing perspective, we're not a bank or a lender. We don't provide any of that, but I'll explain how we provide the financing solutions uh, in the next slide. So the risk mitigation piece is what we call our credit insurance. And so this is something that we can provide to companies of all sizes. Again, doesn't matter, uh, but this is the risk mitigation piece. And so it protects you against non-payment from your foreign buyer. So we commonly call it or refer to it as accounts receivable insurance. Um, it reduces your risk by up to nine or protects you. So in the event that you don't get paid, you're going to recover 90% of the cost of that receivable or, or AR. Um, because of this, it's going to allow you to become more competitive to, uh, to companies outside of Canada or to buyers outside of Canada, because it's going to allow you to stretch on your payment terms. Maybe typically you require 50% up and 50% before shipment. Um, in the competitive global marketplace, that may not go over too well in certain markets. Uh, and so this, this insurance really will allow you to step outside the, the norm for your business and maybe offer net 30 or, or net 45 or whatever it may be. And it's, it's a flexible product. And so at the end of the day, if you have that first international sale or if you're a robust exporter with a, a, a big portfolio of export clients, we can insure one, two, or as many as you want. We do all the investigations so your buyer has no idea nor should they have any inclination of what we're doing. We have a, a database that can tap into a lot of information and provide you with a premium on that particular buyer. Uh, next slide, please. So a, a high level case um, is Jen owns a food production company uh, and has started to receive interest from customers in Germany and, and abroad. And these customers, as mentioned, are asking for payment terms. She knows that this is gonna increase her sales and her brand, but she needs, and she needs to explore other markets to remain uh, sustainable. Her concerns though is, are she, is she gonna get paid? And how is she going to be able to finance carrying this receivable on her books? Well, with the EDC credit insurance in place, you're going to you're going to know and you're going to have that peace of mind in the event of a default from your your buyer. Again, you're going to cover recover ninety percent of the cost of that receivable. So, uh, a pretty significant uh, or uh, amount there. Uh, how this could potentially work uh, from a financing perspective is that in the event that you have a significant amount of receivables on your book, uh, your bank can start lending against those receivables or margining uh, with the insurance in place. Typically banks, the Canadian banks aren't too comfortable in margining against foreign receivables just because there's the world of unknown for them. However, if there's an EDC receivables insurance policy in place and the policy is assigned to the bank, they become the beneficiary. So in the event that your buyer doesn't pay you, your bank is gonna get the proceeds of the claim. However, it's giving you access to more capital. So you, you may have a line of credit in instances where you may not be able to have one uh, otherwise. Next slide, please. So our financing solutions, again, we're not a bank or a lender, but we work with the banks and the credit unions across Canada to get them where they need to be. Really what it is, is at the end of the day is that EDC has the ability to enhance a bank's lending uh, abilities. Uh, this could look in, how this looks could be any number of ways. You could be looking to get an operating line of credit from your bank, uh, a term loan for maybe uh, purchasing of equipment. Um, maybe you're investing in R&D, so you need a shred facility. The point being is regardless of what type of debt structure you're looking to get from your bank, EDC can come in and potentially provide a guarantee. Next slide, please. The, the guarantee is, uh, again, a mechanism to enhance the bank's lending capabilities, and especially when companies are exporting uh, quite 
quite a lot or into markets that aren't traditional, the Canadian banks get a little bit concerned about that. They like to be kept uh, up to speed on, on how businesses are going. They like to be secure. And that's not always the case when you're exporting and going into, into emerging markets. And so our guarantee will provide them with a lot more comfort, knowing that at the end of the day, should things go sideways, they're going to knock on our door. And usually we guarantee 75% of the lending structure in place. So it's a, it's a vast majority of it. Uh, and the bank loves that they, they have that security uh, in the back of their uh, pockets. Next slide, please. So how that would look like, uh, or what that would look like rather, um, Jill's environmentally monitoring technology company has won their largest contract to date in Germany. This contract would double the company's revenue and provide an opportunity to grow in a new market. Jill's challenge is that there is 30 day payment terms from delivery, which will mean working capital strength constraints. And she needs to uh, uh, invest in, in pre-shipment pre financing. So she goes to your bank and says, listen, Mr. Banker, uh, you know, I have this huge opportunity. It's going to really help me grow my brand outside of Canada. I need, get, I need to get some working capital in place. And the bank will come to EDC and say, EDC, can you provide a 75% guarantee on this $500,000 line of credit? And we'll look at the company. We'll look at Jill's company and determine, you know, it, it, obviously, is she an exporter and what her strategy is moving forward? But we'll tell the bank, yes, go ahead lend her the money, we, we will backstop that 75% of it. Um, and it really, again, is a mechanism to enhance their capabilities to lend, to kind of coax, coach them into becoming a little bit more um, open to the idea of lending to companies that they typically wouldn't because the exporting component is, is, has too many, too many variables for the bank. Next slide, please. So the third solution, the, the second working capital solution um, in, that we can provide value on is whenever a Canadian company is required to post their letter of credit or issue a bond of some sort. Uh, there's a variety of ways this could look like, but typically what we see a lot of is Canadian companies re being requested from their foreign buyer to post an advanced payment bond or a performance bond. Really, it's just an uh, a mechanism that uh, the foreign buyer is asking to ensure that the Canadian exporter carries out on the obligations of that contract or PO. And so typically this is a cash instrument. Your foreign buyer may say, listen, I want to purchase, uh, I want to enter into a contract with you. I want to do multiple shipments. Um, however, I need you to give me 30% down so that I know that you're not going to, to uh, renege on this contract. And you'll go to your bank to issue this instrument and the bank will acquire cash collateral. We have the, inst we have the ability in this particular instance to tell the bank, go ahead, issue that letter of credit or bond. We will backstop that 100%. So a little bit different than the other program where we typically cap out at 75. For this particular program, we will backstop that facility 100%. So you don't need to um, use any of your working capital to provide this bond. The bank has no risk because we're backing, stopping at 100% and we're able to help the Canadian exporting company. So if we go to the next slide. The example here is Jim has a million dollar contract in, in Germany that requires a 10% perform, 10 performance bond, um, which is a letter of guarantee or issued in a letter of guarantee or standby letter of credit. Jim speaks to his bank and tells them that he'll need to post, and, they'll tell, and they tell him they'll, he'll need to post cash as a collateral in order to issue the bond. So they're either going to carve it out of his line of credit or ask him for $100,000 cash that they'll lock away and, and secure it against that line of credit, that letter of credit. But as mentioned, that's counterproductive because that $100,000 is what Jim needs to execute and to ramp up and to deliver on this particular contract. So we have a product that will come in and again, backstop that letter of credit 100%. We're not taking any security from the bank. We're not you know, taking any security from the client or the exporting exporter. Really it is at the end of the day, it's a handshake between us and the, the Canadian exporter that they will, they will carry out the terms and conditions of their contract. Uh, and therefore we will backstop that facility 100%. Next slide. 
So at the end of the day, uh, we do have financial tools. That's predominantly a large part of what we do. Uh, we do work with our government aid, government partners, such as the Trade Commissioner Services, because we do have market intelligence and we are often connecting companies with foreign buyers uh, as part of our, our programs. Um, but really what we're judged on is the success of, of Canadian companies in the international market. So if there's any part of the exporting journey that you are struggling with or, or need that advice on, uh, in addition to the other uh, government partners on this call, please feel, re feel free to reach out to EDC. Uh, I'm based here on Vancouver Island. However, uh, we, we do have a team of colleagues on the mainland who are more than happy to assist you. And that is my presentation. Over to you, Ghana. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, great presentation. Thanks for working us through the uh, EDC products as well as some case studies. And uh, this is something definitely to take away from today's webinar. So we are now moving to our last presentation by Andrew Bowder, uh, who will explain the role of the National Research Council of Canada and uh, the details of the industrial co-innovation programs with Germany. Uh, Andrew, over to you and I'll let you share your presentation. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Just uh, one moment while I share my screen here. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. All right, thanks very much. So um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Botter with the National Research Council. Specifically, I'm with the Industrial Research Assistance Program, uh, which is better known as IRAP uh, in Canadian industry. So I'm gonna be talking uh, a little less about doing business in Germany and more about collaborating uh, with German partners, uh, especially in regards to technological uh, collaboration. So I'll just, um, I'm going to talk about a bit about the National Research Council, if you're not familiar with it, the IRAP program, and, uh, and more specifically, how we work internationally uh, in Germany. So briefly, the, um, the National Research Council, I think everyone has probably uh, heard of it, uh, long history in Canada, more than 100 years. Uh, people are probably most familiar with, with the research facilities, uh, the, the time signal that you hear on the radio every day. Um, there is a, a research facility in, in Vancouver, actually, quite a big one, uh, and we're spread across the country. The NRC, as we're known, um, has a number of mandates. One is to advance knowledge through, uh, through uh, innovation and uh, technology development, and also to work directly with business uh, to help them innovate. And there are more than uh, 2,000 engineers and uh, scientists spread across the country are working in NRC research facilities. And then within the IRAP program, uh, where, where I'm, uh, which I'm part of, there's more than 250 advisors spread across the country working directly with Canadian companies. So specifically, IRAP uh, has a focus to help small and medium-sized companies. Grow. Uh, and I'll tell you how we do that. So at a glance, uh, these numbers are a little bit older. We have to update them after the pandemic. But if you look at 2018, 2019, uh, we've invested about $200 million, $300 million in Canadian SMEs. These are companies under 500 people. Uh, we, we provide a lot of advice to companies, uh, well more than 8,000 companies. We fund more than 3,000. So we're not always funding uh, the same companies we're advising. Um, and uh, again, we have more than 250 advisors uh, and we provide various services, which I'll talk about more. So the core of the IRAP program, if you're not familiar with it, is the network of industrial technology advisors. Uh, I'm one of more than 250 across the country. Uh, these advisors come into IRAP with private sector experience, usually later in their career with management uh, technology development experience. And uh, we work closely together to help uh, our, our clients, Canadian SMEs across Canada. So we provide um, advisory services. Uh, that's, that's actually our core, uh, our core goal, uh, to help companies with technical and business advice. We do a lot of referrals to other programs. We're very connected with incubators, universities, colleges, other government programs like the ADC, who we just heard of, provincial programs, and more and more internationally. 
And uh, after providing our advisory services or, or during, uh, we look for opportunities where we can help companies with funding. And we do that through our, our core projects to help companies develop new, new products and processes through technology development, uh, sometimes helping them hire young, young uh, employees. And uh, more and more, uh, we're working to help them with international projects. So when we look at a project in IRAP, um, the basic eligibility for a company to get assistance from IRAP is they have to be uh, an SME incorporated in Canada with less than 500 um, employees. And then we also want to make sure that they're, they're, they have an objective to grow through innovation as we measure uh, the program through the growth of the companies we serve. And then of course, when we look at the company, we look very closely at the opportunity uh, for their business to grow uh, in terms of uh, project they may want to present to us. So we look at the management and the financial capabilities of the company and uh, the potential to, to exploit the technology and grow their company for the benefit of Canada. Of course, we look very closely at the project. We all have technical backgrounds, uh, various uh, disciplines. So we look at the uh, technical project that they want to do, exactly uh, the plan, the challenges, and the team they have in place to do that and the impact that will have on the firm. And as I said earlier, uh, and to stress it, we really focus our efforts on companies that have potential and willingness to grow. Uh, so we want to see them grow, grow their revenues, uh, and of course, uh, hire more, more uh, skilled employees. When you look at the technologies or the industry sectors that we serve, uh, it's really across the board. We, we try not to pick and choose sectors. Uh, it really depends on the companies that, that we deal with. So you can see the digital technology companies, um, we, we do a lot more of that, and that's just the nature of the economy we're in. But we work with companies in agri-food and energy and health and manufacturing, uh, you name it. In terms of the size of the companies we work with, as I said, we can work with companies right up to 500 people. Uh, we work with a lot of small companies under 10 people uh, who are just getting started. Uh, in terms of our international projects, which I'm going to talk about more, we prefer to focus on the companies um, that are a bit larger, a bit more established, uh, able to scale up internationally. So usually more than about 15 people upwards of these 20 to 50 person companies. Uh, we find that they're the best suited for the specifically international projects. And so we, we are working more and more to help companies uh, grow globally, uh, not so much in, in terms of uh, duplicating what the Trade Commissioner Service does to help them expand their markets. What we're looking at is helping them partner with, with other companies and organizations in other parts of the world to develop better technologies and, and to partner to, to get into new markets. So when you look at the world, uh, we work in, in select economies, um, focusing just quickly on the blue. We work with Global Affairs actually to, to deliver a program helping companies connect with uh, partners in Brazil, in India, China, South Korea. Uh, we're working, uh, starting to get programs in Japan. Uh, it's more of a newer program for us. And then the green that you see, you know, is Europe, uh, where we have a very um, established program. Um, through a program called Eureka, I'll talk about briefly. And then within Europe, um, we have multiple programs with Germany. Actually, Germany is the country that we've worked most with internationally, uh, and we have the most projects with. So quite, uh, just quickly, we're part of a program called Eureka. Canada is a member. The National Research Council delivers it on behalf of Canada. Uh, almost every country in Europe, including Germany, is a part of Eureka, and it's basically a platform for countries to work together to co-fund projects, where the funding comes from the national governments. There's, there's no Eureka money. It comes from Canada or Germany or the Netherlands or whichever country. Uh, most important for this discussion, you know, there's a call for proposals twice a year uh, in a program called Eurostars, which is part of Eureka. And uh, basically, it's an opportunity for Canadians and Germans or, or other uh, partners in Europe to work together on projects. It's a competitive call uh, uh, where projects are competing against each other for, for, uh, for it to be ranked high enough for funding. There's another, uh, sorry, 
go through this slide. <laughs> Uh, the, the key with your, your Eurostars is the SMEs in the driving seat. It uh, has to be led by an SME in one of the countries, but uh, sometimes universities and larger companies are involved. There's another program called your Eureka Clusters. I won't get into this right now, but this is an opportunity for companies uh, to work with um, many companies at once, usually in Europe, uh, 10, 20, 30 companies on larger projects. And uh, we can talk more about if anybody has any interest there. And then with Germany in particular, as I said, beyond Eureka, we have bilateral uh, programs uh, because Germany is such a great country uh, for Canada, Canadian companies to innovate with. So for example, we work with the Ministry for Research and Education in Germany, known as BMBF. We've launched a couple of calls for proposals. Uh, these are actually to form consortia of Canadian SMEs working with the universities German companies and German research institutes. Um, and uh, BC companies and universities have been involved um, in, in these calls. We had a call around Industry 4.0, which is around digitalization of manufacturing a couple of years ago. And then last year we had a call around uh, artificial intelligence for manufacturing. Uh, this year, uh, it looked like we'll be addressing hydrogen. Uh, and this actually came out of a recent meeting with uh, our prime minister and uh, and Chancellor Merkel in Germany. So uh, it hasn't been officially announced yet, but it, it looks very much like we'll be doing something around hydrogen uh, to be launched this fall, working with BMBF. We also work with another German program, uh, BMWI, Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Um, and this is more of a, uh, an open call for proposals around all technologies, um, for mainly for SMEs in both Germany and Canada. Um, we've, we've launched eight calls for proposals in the last few years, uh, very successful. We've just launched the ninth call in April, which I'll talk about right now. So the IRAP ZIM program, um, and this is a program to, to develop technologies between German and Canadian companies. Um, all technologies are, are fair game for this. You have to have a strong application, um, a strong market potential. And there should be an obvious advantage, as per all of our projects, for the companies to work together. Uh, as I said, this is focused on Canadian German companies. Sometimes German research institutes are involved with the German companies. Uh, the German government can fund that. Uh, in Canada, for IRAP, we have to focus our funding, at least for this program, on SMEs. And these projects are usually around two years. The last, uh, most recent call was launched in April. In, uh, on September 24th, there'll be a deadline for Canadians only to register with IRAP for expression of interest. So if you're interested in this call for proposals, uh, you can contact me. Uh, we have all the information online and you should register as soon as you can um, it, it, if you're interested. Um, you really, you need a German partner to register for this. Uh, the proposal deadline will be in December and the projects will start in the spring of 2022. Uh, finally, just before I finish, I should mention we work closely with Global Affairs Canada, with Andreas and his team um, in Germany of trade commissioners. Uh, we, we work with Global Affairs to bring companies to Germany when there's no pandemic. In specific areas, we had a bioeconomy mission last year, artificial intelligence mission. And then during the pandemic, we had a mission for med medical technology companies that was virtual. Uh, so we're going to be doing more of these missions this year in specific technology areas. So uh, keep in touch with NRC IRAP and Global Affairs Canada uh, to find, learn more about these missions for Canadian companies to connect with German partners. All right, thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thanks for this uh, very concise presentation. And I'm sure we'll be getting some questions from from the audience later on to to steer the, the discussion. Um, and uh, now uh, I wanted us to begin um, answering some questions that we've been having, uh, that you've been kindly sending us during the whole webinar. I see that we are running out of time a little bit, but we are still able to, to take some of the questions and uh, please do submit some if you still have, uh, have not in the Q&A question pane. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we'll follow up uh, after, after the webinar. 
Uh, so I've seen there were some questions that were already answered by uh, our panelists regarding the uh, indigenous coffee and uh, <clears throat> some information was provided uh, on the hydrogen uh, business as well as the registration for expert dietary supplements in Europe. Um, the potential um, consumers, so finding the potential consumers in the German market, this is something as well that can be directed to uh, Daniela, Rupert and Andreas too. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, outstanding questions, I guess. Uh, one is for Expert Development Canada. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there a minimum uh, contract value for, for this, uh, I guess, for the program? Uh, in general? No, I mean, at the end of the day, again, because we're not a bank, um, your bank's going to be doing the lending, but we provide the guarantees. Uh, if you're talking about the insurance, there is no minimum to protect yourself against non-payment. So, you know, bring it to me, uh, engage with me, and we can have that chat, but we don't have any um, thresholds per se. Okay, great. And Chris, do you have your contact details at the end of your presentation or? You want to share them with the with the attendees? Yeah, I can share them with the attendees. I don't think it's in the PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll put it up. Okay, great. And I think we have one more question uh, regarding the shipment certificate. So I'll just read it loud so that uh, everyone can can see it. Um, so the question uh, reads: uh, We always have to supply for uh, to apply for a shipment certificate from Global Affairs Canada to ship our products that are critical. Uh, metals uh, to the European Union for its diagnostic medicine business. Uh, it is only valid for a month, uh, so we have to do it every time per shipment and client. And uh, they are asking if we have any thoughts uh, to go around this so that they can ship without this hurdle every single time. So I know Andreas wanted to, to answer that question probably to take it. I guess I'm the only one from Global Affairs here so I'll take it. Um, I need more information. I mean, based on your description uh, in, in the Q&A, uh, it sounds like some sort of medical isotope. Um, there are requirements for shipping some types of goods, uh, but, uh, but I'd be happy to engage uh, uh, with you uh, directly and uh, seek some uh, responses from my headquarters to see if there's any easier way that uh, this might be achieved for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much, Andres. And I think we we'll, can just take probably one or two more questions. Um, so uh, there was a question, Andrew, uh, at the registration stage, and I uh, believe this can be relevant uh, to some of the companies that are on the line. Uh, so there was a BC company looking for German SME partners suitable for uh, Zim and Arab funding projects. Uh, and the company was wondering who uh, they might uh, approach uh, to find those partners? Uh, is there any German organization that would help them to connect uh, with suitable partners? Sure, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit tough to answer quickly uh, right now, but I would say um, please contact me directly. Again, if you, uh, you can share my email with, with everyone. Um, short answer is uh, it's, there is no simple way to find partners. Uh, we, we can try working with our partners in the Trade Commissioner Service. Um, not to put Danielle on the spot, but may, maybe she can help on, uh, uh, if, if it's a fit for her, uh, for BC companies. And there's a few other organizations that can help make matches. Uh, so um, sometimes it takes time, but, but please send me an email and uh, I'll try to help. Great, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, and uh, I, think uh, I think Daniela is going to say something. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to add, I'm more than happy to help as well. Um, Perfect. And Andrew and I, we worked together previously, yeah. so um, yeah, just let us know. Yeah, she's very helpful, I can tell you that. Great, and I think Thank we have you. one more question regarding IRAP. Uh, so with the movement towards uh, truth and reconciliation, is there a plan to include indigenous food companies within this program? Uh, that's a good question, and, and I... Uh, Honestly, uh, uh, I don't have the background to, to give a, a full answer. I can tell you we work a lot with food companies in general uh, in IRAP. Um, as whether it's, it has to be incorporated. Um, so I'm not sure if the Indigenous Food Company is, is incorporated or not, but please feel free to contact me and, and I'll do everything I can to help with that. Okay. 
yeah, and we'll make sure that we share your contact details, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I think the last question that we have um, is the list of most important trade shows in uh, uh, in Germany. Um, so I guess, uh, again, uh, might be Daniela or Andreas who could provide the info on that. Sure. Um, certainly from the Trade Commissioner Service, trade shows that we are actively working on and, and are supporting uh, participation at would be available on our website uh, with information. Um, if you're looking at a specific sector, please contact us and uh, I'm sure the responsible trade commissioner would have a list ready to, uh, ready to send you. Great. Thanks, Andreas. And I think we are running a bit out of time. I see that we might have uh, some questions coming, but please uh, be patient. We'll make sure that we'll follow up with you if we uh, have not answered them already. And in the interest of time, we are going to close the, the session. And I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, all uh, speakers and thanks for everyone for attending today's webinar, uh, doing business in, in Germany, market and collaborative opportunities for uh, BC companies. And uh, please keep your eyes um, open for, for the follow-up email with the presentations and contact information. Uh, on behalf of BC government and uh, our speakers, uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day.